Welcome to our weekly Friday talk and tour series when we share the opportunity to visit the studios of our wonderful artists and hear about their works and inspiration. These visits are brought to you by the Duncan McClellan Gallery and the DMG School Project of St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, th thanks for joining us again uh, for our weekly uh, show. Um, it's, it's really wonderful that you support us this way, and we really appreciate it. Um, we haven't been uh, slack. We're doing a lot of things around the gallery, as well as preparing for the future when we do uh, get to service our kids and do all of that. Um, but uh, this is a great way to connect with everyone, and I really want to tell you how appreciative I am for you to be here. Um, so today we have a really great show, a little bit different than uh, our Pure Glass, and, um, and you'll see some incredible work. Um, Mary, take it away and introduce our guest. Thanks, Duncan. As Duncan said, uh, we have two remarkable artists today, Peter Wright and Kim Goldfarb. Peter and Kim have been friends of the gallery as well as personal friends for a number of years, and it's been wonderful to watch both their bodies of work evolve and change as they pursue different concepts. Um, they're one of those unique couples who are actively talented artists individually, and then together, they, their spirits kind of feed each other and their work comes out in this wonderful way. Um, before we get started, want to uh, encourage everyone to ask questions and make comments through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, at appropriate times, we'll take a break and we'll convey those comments and questions uh, to Peter and Kim. Um, Peter and Kim, uh, Peter and Kim live and work at the moment uh, currently in New Mexico. It's a place with very diverse cultures, very magical cultures, and you'll see how it influences their work. Um, we're going to start by introducing Peter and Kim. Um, Peter, and uh, we want to ask you both a little bit about how, your, how you came to where you are. I know that you met in Chicago. Uh, Peter, you were in a different field. Kim, you were a gallery director, I believe. And, um, but kind of came from very diverse places and met each other and decided to go on this path. So we're going to kind of uh, put you in the spotlight and just ask you to tell that story a little bit for our audience so they kind of get a sense of who you are and where you came from. So I was working in commercial construction in Chicago for about 20 years. And I was riding the train back and forth to the city every day. And I was looking at the people who had been doing it for 20 years longer than I had at that time. And they were in pretty rough shape. And I realized that I just didn't want to end up being one of them. So I needed to find myself another avenue of work. And I had been interested in the arts my entire life. My mother's a, a patron of the Art Institute of Chicago and a life member. And so I thought I would find something in the art world that I would enjoy uh, and that would support me. So through a whole series of events too long to explain here, I started a business producing bronzes for other artists who were creating their original works in stone or in wood or clay or whatever medium they worked with. And that took us to New Mexico. Uh, I started that business in 1995. And that took us to New Mexico. Um, we moved there in 97. And I actually met Kim in 95 uh, when she was a gallery director in Chicago. She was managing a gallery that had a lot of work that I was really taken with. And then I went in to see the work and then I was taken with her. <laughs> so here we are in another week, it will be our uh, 23rd wedding anniversary. Mm, happy anniversary. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Let me just interject that uh, 
you know, I think the first time I came to New Mexico was actually like 1986 or so. And I just decided I want to move there. And I wasn't sure how to make that happen. And I, I made another several visits um, back out here. And it was always in the back of my mind that I wanted to move to, uh, to New Mexico. And then uh, Peter came in the gallery one day and we started talking and uh, one thing led to another. And then as we started dating, I realized, oh, he wants to move to New Mexico also. How convenient is this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was very uh, fortuitous. And uh, it, it helps if both people are really psyched up and, and want to have, you know, the same vision of what their lives are going to look like. Well, that's awesome. Uh, uh, and behind you are some of the products of your vision. So this is great. The first two slides we're going to see are set in Santa Fe. I believe they are the location of the hot glass studio where you work, Peter. Um, so you'll see some of the vibe, the Santa Fe, New Mexico, you're in Albuquerque, but New Mexico vibe there. So let's see. All right, so Peter, tell us about Jackalope. So Jackalope is sort of a, a Southwestern Spanish feeling world market, pure one kind of place. And they have a public glass blowing studio there called Prairie Dog Glass. And I rent that studio um, as I need it. I rent it usually one day a week and I use uh, local assistance to help me do what I need to do. And, but you also travel around and work in other hot shops. And here you are, I believe in our hot shop, you've got the DMG School Project, you were a resident and uh, we gave you an exhibit in uh, 2015, I believe. I think my first exhibit, uh, Kim and I exhibited in 2013. Oh. And in fact, the first exhibit I was in was in 2011 in the Distant, Vision, Distant Visions show. That's right. Oh, that's right. I was awesome. in both of those in 2011 and 2012. Wow. So. These pictures are actually taken in Prairie Dogs Hot Shop, but I'm well, still no. I'm still sporting my DMG gear. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and this was in 2013, I think. 13. Okay. Maybe 2012 in your space. So one of the artists that I uh, produce bronzes with is an artist by the name of Liz Wolf, and here she is in her studio with uh, a clay that we made into a bronze, and that should be next. So Peter, um, when someone like Liz comes to you, does she have a drawing? Um, uh, does she just have an idea? How, how does that process happen? So it's different for every artist I work with, but in with Liz, she was referred to me by a gallery that I was already working with, and I went and looked at her work and really liked what she was doing. So I approached her and said, hey, let's make some bronzes together. And what do you want to make? And so it was pretty simple. And that was 20 years ago and we're still going at it now. Wow. So uh, here she is in the wax room at the foundry putting some uh, real antlers onto a, uh, a clay sculpture that we ended up reproducing in bronze. And here he is in the garden in Santa Fe on Canyon Road. And here's another one of her pieces uh, over in the Pinnacle Peak area of North Scottsdale on the edge of an infinity edge pool. Another fellow that I work with uh, is named Hib Sabin, and he's a wood carver. He's in his mid 80s now, uh, but we've been also working together for about 20 years. And this is a case of he came to me originally, um, heard what I was doing, and, and wanted to talk about doing some things together. So we started working together about 20 years ago, and I take his wood carvings and make molds off of them and then reproduce them as bronzes. Here's a wood carving of a spirit canoe. I get them before they're painted, 
um, and, and then we reproduce them in bronze. And here's the bronze of the same piece. Now, uh, Peter, you, you mentioned that most of the people you work with, you've worked with for at least 20 years? Seems like it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but it's been that long. Um, I've worked with other people over the years, but the people I'm choosing to show you today are, are the people that I have my best connections with and that I've worked with the longest. So here's, again, these were all wood carvings originally. This is the bronze. And it's about two feet tall. So here's a wood carving. These are the way I get the pieces um, in this condition when I make the molds off of it. And then, I, and then we give them back, and this is the painted version of the piece. Hmm. Now, Peter, do you ever um, have any design input? Do you say to someone like Hib, um, you know, I, I think it would work better if it looked a different way, or do you just let them have artistic license completely? Well, it's mostly um, let them have artistic license. The only time I might say something is when I'm thinking about our technical process. This figure on the left in this um, piece here called the dance, I asked him not to attach the hands, for example, until after we were done molding them. It would have been much harder to mold them if everything was one piece. Or some of the legs we might have to cut off and mold them separately. But generally, I don't like telling an artist how to make their art. Sure. You know, uh, I work with them because I like what they do, and uh, I just might give them technical advice thinking about my process down the road. So here's another fellow that I work with. Now, this is somebody that I approached, is William Morris, and uh, we started working together with him at the end of the year 2000. Uh, the piece on the left is a glass piece. The one on the right is the bronze we made of it. This is the first one we ever made together. And this was from his Man Adorned series. Now you'll see the, the glass piece on the left doesn't have an earring, but Bill wanted to add the earring to put a touch of glass on the one on the right. So he sent me a box of earrings to attach to the bronzes. So and you approached Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I did. And here's the same piece in a different color. One of the things that he was real clear about when we started is that he wanted me to have fun with this and everything didn't have to look identical. He said, make them different colors, you know, do whatever you want, but enjoy it. So, wow. so yes, I did approach you. And here's another, uh, this is a piece from his personal collection. Um, that is just not for sale. And then here it is in a couple of different finishes, same piece, just different finishes. So that's some of the liberty that he gave us. Here is a, this piece, um, when I first met with him, this piece was on his kitchen island. And I made a comment about how much fun I thought my mold maker would have with all these horns. Okay. And uh, we both had a laugh about that and then moved on in our conversation. And then about two weeks later, that piece just showed up at my house. Wow. And I thought, oh, good. Let's see how, how badly we can scare the mold maker. And here's the, <laughs> here's the bronze that we made from it. And then I like this piece so much, I wanted to see it big. So here it is big. Um, <laughs> we, um, you can see on, on the left is, is a bronze copy without a finish on it <clears throat> that we used as our model. And we freehand enlarged it in clay. And then this picture was taken the first day that Bill saw the enlargement. You know, we took it about 90% of the way, and then he flew in from Hawaii to work with us in Santa Fe to work on this. And then he hung around and uh, we finished it. So when you said freehand, uh, there wasn't like digitally graphed out? Um, um, no, no. It was, it was freehand. Um, the, the board that it's sitting on, the clay, has a grid on it that's A, B, C, D one way and one, two, three, four the other way. 
and then it's all crossed like a checkerboard so you can refer to a point. Um, the squares on this big grid are four and three quarter inches and then in the shot where you saw the little bronze it's on a similar grid but they're one inch squares. So we decided to do a four and three quarter enlargement so we went if you wanted to go to like point A6 you could go to both and reference back from one to the other but other than that everything was done freehand wow and here it is in his new home in boca the collector who has this has it outside his uh, breakfast nook so he can watch it every day when he's having his breakfast <laughs> And that was uh, actually um, at SOFA, correct? At a, a SOFA yeah. Chicago. Can you just go back for a sec, Danielle, to that slide? Yeah. So yeah. that was SOFA um, Chicago in, what year was that? Oh, um, 2015, maybe, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there. And we sold him in the first hour of the show, which was a real thrill. And it made the rest of the show a lot more relaxing, knowing that we we covered our expenses as soon as they opened the door. It was the talk of the show. Yeah. <laughs> How much does he weigh, Marion asks? Uh, about 675 pounds. He's hollow. And that is the foundry proof for this little stag right here. Um, when we do an addition, a lot of times we will create a foundry proof to have as a reference piece. And then uh, we do a numbered edition. This was a numbered edition of 15 and they're all sold. Um, they sold out at least 10 years ago. And this is the foundry proof from that edition. So you won't make any more? This, this no. is, this is once, the proof. once the edition is, is all cast, the molds are destroyed. So, now we're moving into my work and the, the things that interest me are mostly uh, early ancient arts, primitive arts, pre-technology arts and I, I like tools and vessels and artifacts and this particular piece is a tool used by the Inuit people um, and they started making these probably 4,500 years ago. It's called an ulu and it's made from slate and it's napped much like an arrowhead and it's a it's a sort of an all-purpose tool they might skin an animal with it they might cut their hair with it they might cut hides with it but it's a it's a tool that's passed down through the family through the generations and they believe that the spirit of the ancestors is embodied in these and accumulates as it's passed through time now normally these would have a, a stone uh, blade and the handle might be made out of whalebone or caribou antler or walrus ivory or something and if you see these two notches it would be lashed on in some fashion with some type of gut this one there's no handle but that's it and then the, ne the next piece is something i made inspired by that i love this series so I only made a few of those, and these are the only two that I've hung on to. So can you describe the, um, on the Ulu, can you describe the surface a little bit, Peter? So on this one, all the colors on the surface, and then the piece was acid etched to take the shine off. On the previous one, um, on the bottom half, that black color is on the inside, and the outside and then the outside was carved away to make it look like an arrowhead that had been napped or a piece of slate that had been napped like a like an ulu so um, it is a much rougher surface but then it was acid etched again i generally don't like shiny i mean sometimes i do but a lot of times i don't and i want these things to have a feel of age a little bit and i also want the viewer to be more interested in the form first. I don't want them to, to be on the other side of the room and see something shiny and go, oh, there's some glass over there. I want the form to attract them first and then they can realize when they get closer what it's made from. 
Thank you. So this particular piece is part of a series in, inspired by the ladders that you see um, in the Pueblos and in the cliff dwellings. Uh, because we live in New Mexico, Pueblos, cliff dwellings, they're all over the Southwest. And the people who used to live in them a thousand years ago didn't have stairs. They made ladders to move from level to level, and then they would pull the ladder up behind them for security. Um, but today, it's one of the most iconic images you see in New Mexico with the ladder leaning up against the side of a building or against the side of a pueblo somewhere. So that's what inspired this series. And this particular one, uh, two of the fellows that work with me are from Northern Pueblos. And we were at a dance at the Taos Pueblo and there was a raven sitting on top of one of the ladders during the dance and giving everybody the business. So that's what this piece was all inspired by. And again, here's a couple more totems that are inspired by the, the native ceremony. Both of these are, are inspired by the ladders and the singing that goes on uh, during all the dances. They're singing all the time. So that's fresh out of the annealer. And then the next shots are probably after they've been finished. Yeah. So that's one more. Um, yeah. No, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I have been collecting masks, probably of different cultures since I was 16 years old. So the next few pieces are just inspired by masks of different cultures. This is an Inuit inspiration, um, a Greenland Inuit. Um, and that's what's, this is just sort of my own design of a, a shaman's mask. You know, they often have a headdress or a frontlet of some sort on. And you had an, a unique experience with this piece. Uh, when I, you did, I did. You know, the crackle process is a really random process. I have no control over it. And I think in the detail shot of this, you'll see that the glass gods decided to perfectly place an eye in here for me. And that I was be... just going to say that's one of my favorite pieces. I love it. So is there a detail? There he is. Mm -hmm. So on the viewer's right or his left, of all the ways that crackle pattern could have formed, it formed right in that eye socket. Glass gods were kind that day. <laughs> so this is an artifact from uh, Western Mexico from a couple thousand year, years ago. It's called a mezcal figure and it was carved from a stone axe head originally. The Mezcala people lived in what's now uh, Oaxaca in Western Mexico. And they were 2000 years ago. So I made some pieces that were inspired by that. Um, I'm very fascinated by the way a lot of these ancient stone carvings are made because there was no metal for tools. So just their way of figuring out how to carve stone is, is very interesting. And sometimes they're engraved. And so this one was all black with red underneath and I carved most of the black away to show the red underneath and left this little bit of black on the surface. And how is the carving done in, this, in a piece like this? So I took, I drew on this piece with a Sharpie just when it was all black and shiny. I drew on it with a silver Sharpie and then I cut strips of tape and laid them on there to create my design. And once I had a design that I was happy with, I went to the sandblaster and just uh, anything that didn't have tape on it, I blew the black off with the sandblaster to reveal the red underneath. And then I peeled the, the tape off and the black was still there. So same thing here, uh, you know, where you see that, that pale yellow that was sandblasted off. Everything else was covered up with tape. So another interest of mine is the natural world. And this is a pitcher plant that you find in tropical rainforests. They hang on a long stem that comes out of that leaf behind it. The center rib of the leaf just kind of keeps going out into space and it forms this pod on the end. 
that's actually a carnivorous plant. And uh, it has a little rain cap on it. So when it rains, the lid shuts so it doesn't fill up with water. And it's interesting when you see a whole cluster of them and the wind is blowing a little bit or the rain is hitting them a little bit. They're all bobbing and weaving like they're having some kind of a, a little meeting, a little Zoom conference. So they were the inspiration for a series that I did of uh, pieces based on them. So. So this is quite a lot. Uh, this first piece was is quite large. The piece that um, you're just taking out. How much does something like that weigh? Oh, it you know it probably weighed 15 pounds. You know, and out on the end of a pipe, and it's 28 inches long. So out on the end of a pipe, it feels a lot heavier. Um, we use a pretty good sized blowpipe for those, and it, you know, it probably feels like 40 or 50 pounds when it's on the end of the pipe. Sure. And here's a whole group of them. I like to see them in nature in groups, and I like to see them as an installation in, in groups again. So again, there's a, a little tiny one in the front that's about 19 inches, and then there's the big one in the back. So a little range of sizes. And these are right behind Irene, I think. Well, two of them are at Creative Pinellas in the Glass on the Gallery show in Largo, Florida. Um, uh, but one of them is behind Irene, that's correct, yeah. So this is the view from our kitchen window. We live right next to Albuquerque in the village of Los Ranchos. This, I zoomed in a little bit, but this was maybe 70, 60 to 70 feet from the kitchen window to these creatures. And they're there most of the summer. And so they inspired a series that I made um, that I call fetishes. And here's one right here. They're sort of a, a mixture be between the Zuni fetishes from the Zuni Pueblo and that view from my kitchen window. And then I like the bird form so much I made a couple of just of the birds. And these are about 17 or 18 inches long each bird. Very playful. Yeah, very, very simple pieces. So another interest of mine is texture. And this is the first piece where I ever experimented with Batuto. So I blew the vessel and, and then I masked it off and the area that you see that's carved now, I just drew on that and I sent it up to Lino Talia Pietra's cold worker and with some notes and then he carved it for me and sent it back. And as I said, this is the first one we ever did. So again, these pieces, I mask them off with tape and then I draw the design on them and then I take the tape away and then I send them up to be carved and wherever there's no tape, that's where they carve. And I make some sketches and I maybe take a few pictures and write a few notes and send them up. And then they'll do the rough cutting first and then text me some pictures and I'll say, yeah, your nay, make this bigger or smaller and then finish. So I feel very fortunate to be able to work with uh, Lino's principal cold worker on these pieces. You know, that's the one thing about glass. It's such a team sport um, that I, I really like the involvement of other people when we're doing this. You know, Kim is in the studio by herself, it's a very solitary thing where it's glass, you know, you're in a hot shop, there's three or four people in there all the time, unless you're making, you know, cups or something. So this is a, another piece that's been carved. This is actually on loan right now, it's in the art and the embassies program. And the entire piece has been carved, the bottom half is carved as well. I don't know if we have a detail of that or not. And this is his companion. Nope. I think there's a detail of this one. 
of the bottom half. Yeah, you can see the, the entire piece has been carved from top to bottom. So, as, as have these, these pieces are wall mounted um, and they're carved over their entire surface. And how are these mounted, Peter? So there is a, a company in California called Hang Your Glass that makes aluminum hardware and stainless steel hardware that's actually glued on the back of the glass. There's a piece glued to the glass and there's a piece screwed to the wall or receiver. And then the piece on the, uh, on the glass has a tab on it and the receiver on the wall, you know, it just slots right into it and you just click it in. Wow. There's one little post back there, but they can hold a spectacular amount of weight. Wow, good to know. And here's a detail shot so you can see the texture. And here's an installation in a client's home. The one in the center is 30 inches and the ones on the sides are each about 24 inches. And here's another, uh, another group I made. These are called Bosque Seeds. The forest along the Rio Grande is known as the Bosque. And in the spring, there's Chinese elms and cottonwoods that throw out literally tens of millions of seeds. And our property gets covered with these seeds. It looks like it's snowed out. There are so many of them. And they all open. And if you don't scoop them up, you'll have little trees growing everywhere. So that's sort of the inspiration for this series. And this is just different arrangements of the same thing. So Peter, we have a question about your uh, cold worker. I know that you said uh, you sent it to Lino's cold worker. And uh, Anthony's asking, uh, would that be Karsten? Yes, it uh, would. Yes. Karsten Oaks, yeah. So you're working with the best, as well as being the best. Well, if you have a choice, always work with the best. <laughs> so again, these are just different possible arrangements. They can be arranged all different kinds of ways. So Here's in one of my animal spirit jars. I think over the years, this is the series I probably made the most of. I do this with Hib Sabin. Um, I create the glass piece first and I make a wood stopper and then I give it to him and I tell him what kind of figure I want him to carve and then he carves it in his style. You may remember earlier in the presentation, I showed a picture of some bronzes that I've made with him so you can recognize his style. And then he carves it in his style. He paints the stopper and he paints the, uh, the head or the bird, whatever we end up putting on top. And, and these what are, is your, oh, go ahead. These are just based on ancient ceremonial vessels. You know, again, pre-technology, people were making things from clay and from wood and they were making utilitarian vessels for everyday use. They were making ceremonial vessels. And the ceremonial ones had some level of importance and they were ornamenting them in some way. And all, one way they did it was with the really fancy stoppers. So that's kind of the inspiration for these pieces. And this and is this one is of your newest works, right? One, one of your newest works. This is brand new. This is yep. brand new. It was just photographed the other day. This one and the hawk that follows it are brand new. Uh, here's the hawk. So again, Hib carved the um, hawk. I made the stopper. Karsten carved the neck on the bottle. And these are all my design choices, um, but other people helped me execute them. Beautiful combinations. Well, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Suzanne is asking if you could explain the surface crazing process. And on the next slide, we'll see a little a close up of that, I believe, um, right here. So the, the crackle finish, is that what we're talking I about? I think so, yes. Yeah. So 
you know, early on at the very beginning of this presentation, there was a picture of me in my proud DMG t-shirt and I was stuffing a, a piece of hot glass in a bowl of powder. And that piece had been crackled. Um, I get this piece as hot as I can get it without it falling off the blowpipe. And then I stick it in a bucket of water and that just for a second, but that freezes the skin and the, but the inside is still hot. And then I blow into it, the inside expands, the outside is not hot enough to expand, so it crackles open. And then I stuff it in that bowl of powder and turn it around and the powdered color goes into all those cracks. And then I take it and wipe off the surface with a damp rag and the water um, takes off the powder on the part that's cold, but the, the powder stays in the cracks. And then I put it back in the glory hole and heat it back up again and those cracks close up and hold that powder in place. So it is by chance, though, you don't... Um... Yeah, it cracks however it wants to crack. You know, I make it crack, but I can't control where. Thank you. So this is a, another one of the animal spirit jars. My personal favorite. Um, it's kind of hard to let him go. They all have to find a home somewhere. This is another beauty. So, so Marion asked, asked um, why your eagle was wrapped up. Is so there a reason for that? There is, and it's, um, it's a cultural answer. I believe, personally, that we all have a, an eternal soul. And the soul is in my body for a while, and then my body's going to be gone, and that soul may come back again in another body or not. But I, that piece sort of represents the eternity of the soul to me. The body is fleeting, but that binding is, is holding them together. And then at some point, the body will move on and the soul will move on. But that's more about the eternity of the soul. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, those are beautiful pieces, and I and we know that uh, you know you're just going to continue to make wonderful, wonderful work. Um, all of those pieces uh, that dimensions and prices are available, and you'll receive an email uh, with a list of those. But also, if you have any technical questions, any questions about process, please feel free to ask us now and and after the presentation, also. Um, continue the dialogue. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank and you. I know it's it's kind of it's not the end of the conversation. The conversation will always go on, but unfortunately, because of time, we have to introduce Kim um, as well um, because we want to see what she's up to. So um, Kim Goldfarb uh, works in with Peter, but she's a painter. Um, has worked in different mediums, I believe, but we're going to let Kim tell us a little bit about herself. We'll see a short video and then some of her most recent work. Well, first of all, let me just tell you that I'm very appreciative of being included here. I, I really thank you for that. So, uh, yes, I have been working in, in several different uh, medias and most recently returned to painting. Actually, it's been several years ago now. And uh, I really do paint intuitively. So I'm not like some artists who really plan out what they're going to do. I have actually no idea when I walk into the studio, um, which is actually on our property, by the way. And so all I have to do is just walk out the back door and walk to my studio. And I, I always feel the need to go create. It's like, it's like this energy that wells up in me and I just have to go do it. But I stand in front of my panels and it's kind of like I say, okay, creator, you show me what you want me to do today because I don't know. I just know that I have to do it. And uh, so it's, it's crucial to who I am that I get that out of me. 
So, um, you know, let's show the video and we can find out more about what I do. Hi, I'm Kim Goldfarb. Welcome to my studio in New Mexico. In my personal life and in my artistic process, I like to take the road less traveled. On my journeys, I enjoy veering off the main route. I'm always attracted to the back roads, the uncharted territory. The unexpected calls to me. That is why I don't plan my paintings. I don't prepare. I just start making marks on a panel. Those marks take me to my next move. Somewhere in the process, these women appear. They are real women you could reach out and touch. They have feelings and a story to tell. You can find me with them somewhere on the road less traveled. When I'm starting, I'm just really trying to get an essence of movement or find an emotion, find an, a, a feeling that's within the marks that I make. Sometimes I find shapes in the abstraction. I might see a woman's face in the abstraction. I might see an arm, a thigh, the turn of a head. Those are the kind of things that I look for within the abstraction and then I start to draw an image with the charcoal. When I was in school, I had a really strong foundation in figurative drawing. And so now when I'm working, after I've done the abstraction, if I see some shapes and a form in the abstraction, I get out my charcoal and I just start drawing. And I can usually draw the figure just out of my own memory because I've done it so many times. Emotion is a huge part of my uh, process of everything that I do actually because more than an actual physical space that these women are in, they're in an emotional space. And um, I guess that I want people to be touched by my work on an emotional level. It's been a long evolution in my work. A long time ago, I was a totally an abstract painter. Then I went to sculpture. Then I went back to painting. I went back to painting for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of which was watching a movie on Jackson Pollock. And I was, I was watching Ed Harris portray Jackson Pollock. And there's a scene in an old barn in New York State where he was throwing paint around and just like had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and he was tossing the paint around and all of a sudden this emotion just welled up inside of me and I started crying and I thought oh my gosh I miss this like crazy this is my true calling and so I had to get back to painting my last group of paintings dealt with my childhood memories of growing up in the deep south the women and children depicted are people of color. During that time, I witnessed their courage, their strength, and their determination, and I wanted to honor them. Here in New Mexico, the scenery is just incredible. It's, it's an amazing, beautiful place. You don't see it in my paintings, per se, but it's something that influences what I do because it is such a, a huge sense of space. And I love beauty and I love a sense of openness and, and actually I love being alone in the studio because instead of being alone, I'm really in here with, with my friends that, I, <laughs> that I've been creating. And um, so that's a really amazing part about New Mexico is the sense of solitude, the sense of, um, of beauty, of majesty. I have a need to do this work. If I never made a penny off of it, I would have to do it regardless because there's something in me that says these women need to have a voice, I need to have a voice, and I love what I'm doing and there's no way that I could quit.
somehow or the other, this is my life, this is what I do. We're going to see a few slides, and this uh, this first one here is uh, in my studio. It just gives you a sense of, of scale of, of the work, and uh, I just want to quickly say that my work keeps evolving, and the urgency to paint just continues to grow stronger, and uh, I'm in the studio almost every day because... Um, it just feels good to me. That's that's what I love to do. So this painting is called The Beach. And I, I actually grew up in uh, South Georgia and I was very close to the ocean. And so I have a couple of paintings that I've done that talk a lot about um, the beach, the ocean. And some people have told me that the uh, woman in the polka dot bathing suit looks a lot like me and so I thought well okay just part of my desire to find myself at the beach so this painting is uh, is really new and it has uh, a lot of movement and energy in it and also no face and uh, recently I've decided that maybe all my paintings don't need faces and uh, so this is one that's more about the energy and the movement and I also used uh, some designed uh, printed art papers that I ripped and tore and glued onto the surface in this one. So this painting is one of my personal favorites. I started out with just a black background on this and I just picked up some white chalk and started drawing and the figure just kind of popped out of me and you know, she's got a, a look of satisfaction on her face. And uh, as I have thought, it's kind of like she got out of a hot tub and she's just relaxed and feeling good about life. So this painting is called Silhouette. And again, I'm using a lot of the, the papers here and no face. It was hard for me not to put a face on this one. It had a face for a while and then I said, nah, it doesn't need it. It really gets what I want to get across much better without it. So this one, uh, Circle of Life, started out with me standing in front of the panel on the easel and I was just um, using some um, high flow acrylic paint in a, um, in a bottle and I just stood in front of the panel and I started making circles, just da -da 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 -da. And as I made the circles, I felt rhythm, and then I felt dance, and then I felt a figure, and then the Native American figure. And uh, so then the painting became more solid, but it's like the figure is moving in and out of being a solid three-dimensional form. And again, very loosely based on going to a lot of Pueblo dances. So these paintings do come out of my subconscious. And since I am not intending anything in particular when I start, as I worked on this painting, I realized uh, something about myself. I have a tendency to look back at the past and you know, regret some of the decisions I made, some of the things I did. And then I realized, no, that's really not a good thing. We all make mistakes and it's really better just to move forward and don't look back. This painting um, really was strongly influenced by a dear friend of mine who actually has one blue eye and one brown eye. And she is a Gemini. And she has a lot of energy. She's an older woman, um, but has so much energy, would never know what her age is. So I admire her tremendously, and she inspired this painting. Uh, this painting is called Joy, and I think it's, it's a lot about just the joy of a mother and a daughter and the experiences that they have together 
and in this case, maybe in a dance class. Kim, what are you painting on? What is the surface? Is it canvas or? Uh, no, it's, it's, um, it's a panel, a wood panel. And uh, I need the hard surface because of all the, you know, I, I do a lot of scraping and a lot of drawing with charcoal and I don't like the, uh, the surface to, to move like a canvas does. I want it to be, you know, stiff. Mm -hmm. So this painting, um, can we go, thank you. Back to this one. This is called uh, Lightbringer, and uh, she started to have the feeling of an, of an angel, an angelic being. And then I, I thought about, okay, where is this coming from? And I realized that instead of an angel, she represents all of us who have the ability to bring light into the world today where things can be a little dark, so we could all use some light. This painting is called Mixed Race, and uh, here in New Mexico, we have a lot of blending of the races, and uh, particularly with the native uh, cultures and the Spanish, and I, I personally think that the combinations, when you mix races, you get a lot of attractive people. Here's more of my beach thing, my ocean yearning. Uh, so I, I feel like that this is a painting also about uh, creation and the one woman doesn't have a face and the, the fish is jumping up near her to give her some information and help her in her formation. So it's kind of a creation myth. And this is a uh, secret place and it's uh, one of my newer paintings also incorporating some of my uh, papers. And uh, it's really about all of us needing to have, particularly at this time, a, a place that is just our own, where we can go and relax and meditate and have our secret place. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, Beautiful body of work. We have a question from uh, Susan, who's asking, when you say real women, what do you mean? Because you don't use models. So. No, I don't use models. I, um, I use myself. I have a big mirror in the studio and I look at myself if I need reference to a pose. And I also have uh, books for artists that have models that are in various poses. So when I'm saying real women, they don't start out as anything uh, with real uh, form to them, but they, they develop the form and their personality as I work on them. And sometimes, you know, in the evenings when I return to my studio and I go in and I turn the lights on and I look at them, it's like, oh, somebody's here. So to me, they just give off the vibe of, of having a soul and being being a person. And you had said they exist in an emotional place. You know, they, they exist not necessarily just in our physical space, which goes back to uh, Peter's eagle that's wrapped, you know, and the spirit that's held within that body. Um, so in a more technical question, Peter, um, we have a question, how do you, when you're blowing a piece like the snowy owl behind you, how do you get the circle in the glass? So, so if you can imagine a big lollipop, because that's what it looks like on the end of a blowpipe, and whenever we start blowing, it's always a round form, it's always a ball, and it just keeps getting bigger. Well, I take these cork paddles, and squish it on both sides to flatten it out so it's more like a lollipop. And then I get the center of that lollipop area hot on both sides directly opposite each other. And I pinch them together so that the two sides touch. And then I stick something sharp through there to make a little hole in there because I can't let the air out. So I have to make those two sides touch. And then I just keep working with a bigger and bigger tool. And my final tool that I use to, to ream that hole out 
is actually a fence post. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got a I got a section of uh, fence post at the hardware store, and I cut it down to about two feet long and sharpened it like a pencil. And it's four inches in diameter. And uh, I start with a drill bit, you know, and just drill a hole through there. And then once I've got the hole through there, I use tweezers and jacks and whatever tools I have to keep making the hole bigger and bigger. And I, you know, keep reheating it because it's got to get super hot in there so that it'll stretch and not tear and open. And then ultimately I go through there with a fence post and ream it out. <laughs> well, that, you know, that's a secret you're going to, we're going to have to somehow uh, guard now that it's, you know, you've spoken about it, but we're going to have to shut that down. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's wonderful. Um, does anyone else have questions or comments? Duncan, I know that uh, you've enjoyed, you know, working with uh, Peter and Kim and... Oh, very much so. Um, I was fascinated uh, by the bronzes. Um, can you explain some of the patina processes and uh, what goes on in creating those magnificent colors? So we have two very different processes. We have a hot process and a cold process. And there was a, a picture of two William Morris pieces side by side. One was green, one was brown, and the green one was done cold. Um, we create a big container. Uh, that we stuff with sawdust and soak all that sawdust in different chemicals and then we stick the raw bronze in there and just bury it and, and leave it sealed up in there for a couple days and the different chemicals that we select can create different colors. Um, as far as a hot patina, again we have different chemicals that create different colors so our patinure has the raw bronze, he's got a torch in one hand, and then he's got the color in the other hand, and he may be using an airbrush, he may be using a squirt bottle, a paintbrush. There's all different types of application techniques depending on what effect he's trying to create. If he's trying to create a smooth color, he might use an airbrush. If he's trying to create something that looks sort of cobwebby, uh, he might, use a spray bottle or he might stipple with the end of a brush. So it really depends on just what he's trying to do. But one is heat and chemicals and the other one is just buried in wet sawdust and chemicals. Well, yeah. is the cold process easier to control or is it oh. all like Raku and you never know what you're gonna get? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. I mean, we have some idea depending on which chemicals we use. Um, if we use some of the cupric or the copper-based chemicals, we know we're going to go in more greens. If we use more ammonia-based things, we're going more blue. If we use something that's more iron-based, it may be more in a red direction. Um, but beyond that, influencing a direction, we don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. So that's half the fun, just like you say with Raku, opening that kiln and pulling it out. Um, one of the artists that I work with, uh, Liz Wolf, does a lot of pit fired clay work. And after her clay has been fired in a kiln, she'll take it out. She has a big 55 gallon drum that she fills up with pine needles. And she lights them on fire and she throws the piece in there and turns it around a couple of times. And it gets um, smoke marks, burn marks all over it. And again, you don't know where they're gonna go. It's, it's just like crackling glass. You know it's going to happen, but you just don't really know exactly how it's going to look until it happens. And then you pull it out and, and, you know, you love it or you hate it. Have you ever hated any? Um, I have, and I have a hammer here. <laughs> so there, you know, there are pieces that go into the annealer that I feel good about, and then I pull them out and then maybe they're crooked or the color combination didn't work. Um, you know, the <laughs> piece is always in motion on the pipe. So we do the best we can to get it oriented in a certain direction. And then it comes out and sometimes I say, man, this is great. Or what was I thinking? And what was I thinking is usually a visit to the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> it's 
Hey, Peter, it's David and Dale Goldheim. I saw your name down there. How are you? We're good. How about you? Well, obviously, we know how you are. We love your new work. We think Thank it's you. extremely thank impressive and wish you continued success. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you both. And it's nice to see you. Thank you. Well, actually, mm -hmm. nice to hear you because I mm -hmm. can't see you. We have a few more quest, uh, comments. Uh, Darlene says that, Kim, your paintings would make wonderful glass sculptures, and uh, you'll, you'll have to work on that with Peter. Um, and Jason says that uh, your, your technique, Peter, seems so non-traditional, and um, that's, it makes it even more impressive. Um, actually, both your works. So, um, you know, you're not sticking to just the traditional technique, but you're exploring with it. So that's really awesome. Yeah. So Bill Morris said to me a long time ago that there's really nothing that you can't make out of glass. You just have to figure out how to do it because there really aren't any instructions. Um, there's no book that says if you want to make a representation of the cow in the pasture next to your kitchen, you go to page 12 and first you do this and first you do that. You have to figure out how to do it. And everybody approaches it different. Um, I've been in situations uh, where I've seen the same artists make something that at the end looks the same, but the way they get there is totally different. Totally. So Absolutely. everybody has to figure it out for themselves. I think that's what I like about it so much. It's, it's a constant puzzle. Right. And uh, you show the variation of your works behind you and the circle of life painting, I think is a perfect uh, comment on, on your careers and your lives uh, separately and together. And so thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Next week, we are visiting with Elodie Holmes, which will be a wonderful visit also. And Peter and Kim, thank you so much. We can't wait to get you back to Florida and for us to get back to New Mexico. So um, if, any, if anyone has any questions, we can also do a virtual tour with Peter and Kim, look at their work more closely, um, just uh, approach the gallery uh, through Duncan, Irene, Danielle, and we'll be sure to make that happen for you all.